I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live, President Zelensky is promising victory against Russia as he marks Ukrainian Independence Day. Zelensky is also thanking the U.S. for a new multi-billion dollar aid package as he warns of stepped up attacks now six months since the Russian invasion. President Biden is expected to make an announcement about student loans. Could another round of relief be on the way? We have the latest from Washington. And veterinarians are scrambling to figure out why at least 30 dogs have reportedly died in Michigan. Hear what we're learning now about the mystery illness and what pet owners should look out for. Well, we begin with President Biden announcing a $2.98 billion aid package to Ukraine. The president broke the news in a written message congratulating Ukraine on its Independence Day today. President Zelensky, in a press conference with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, thanked Biden for the aid, saying the U.S. and Ukraine fight for the same values. The aid package includes weapons and equipment for Ukraine's war with Russia. As President Zelensky warns, this Independence Day could be filled with brutal strikes. Our chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel leads us off from Kiev. Ukraine celebrates its Independence Day as it never has before, with fears today could see increased Russian attacks. In an address to the country, President Zelensky warning that the national holiday could bring hideous Russian provocations and brutal strikes. Multiple strikes in Kharkiv, seen in this video posted online as rescuers rush to put out fires and sift through the destruction. Sources from the State Department say the U.S. has shared declassified intelligence with Ukraine, saying there's heightened risk of Russian strikes on highly populated centers. The U.S. is again urging all Americans still in Ukraine to to leave the country. This as Ukraine accuses Russia of renewed shelling at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, badly damaging the infrastructure and even briefly causing the power to be disconnected. Ukraine says that Russia's also been intentionally shelling ash pits near the plant where nuclear waste is stored, raising radioactive dust into the air. In response to the volatile situation, the United Nations holding an emergency meeting, Western officials calling out Russia for risking a nuclear disaster. As we speak, Ukraine, neighboring states, the entire international community are living under the threat of a nuclear catastrophe. Why on earth is a nuclear facility being used as a staging ground for war by Russian forces? Diane, this really was a city of fear and dread exactly this day six months ago. We'd already had Russian missiles that had struck the city and Russian special forces were just on the outskirts. I think we were all braced, really, for a sense that Putin's forces were going to sweep in and seize power. But as the wreckage of those Russian tanks and artillery pieces behind me show, they were roundly defeated and withdrew. I don't think anybody expected that Ukrainian forces would put up such a stout, brave, defense. We really saw the entire nation coming together to rally around the cause of war. Six months on, though, and we've got this grinding, slow, bloody battle that's settled in in towns and cities in different parts of this country. And they're still under attack every single day. If day one was the start of a fight for their very survival in Ukraine, today it's only escalated into this brutal battle with no end in sight. Diane. All right, Ian Panel from Kiev. Stay safe, Ian. Thank you. And Chef Jose Andres, founder of the World Central Kill Kitchen, is sounding the alarm on unharvested land in Ukraine and the impact it's having on the global food crisis. Andres and his organization, World Central Kitchen, have done extensive work in Ukraine and neighboring countries. And he now joins us live from Spain with more on this. Chef, thank you again for being on. We've kind of followed you throughout this journey. And I want to talk about your work in Ukraine. But I, uh, first, I want to talk about this warning um, that, that you're issuing now, because Ukraine is known as Europe's breadbasket. And you say that as you go through the country, you still see rich farmland and even crops growing, but no one harvesting them. Can you walk me through what's happening there and the global impact? Well, I want to make sure that maybe uh, the tweet uh, I put, which I think is the one you're referring to, was maybe misunderstood. What I'm saying is that Ukraine farmers must be harvesting all that sunflower, all that wheat, all that corn. Because let's make one thing clear. Ukraine is obviously under attack, but the entire society is joining forces and everybody is doing what they have to do. The soldiers defending their country, the farmers making sure the land is fertile and keeps producing. But 
Ukraine has enough food to feed itself for two or three years. Ukraine and food is not going to be an issue. The Ukrainian people are going to be fed. What we know is that the important uh, grain and cereal that Ukraine produces must be exported. So three, 400 million people that depend each year from the cereal coming out of Ukraine will have an opportunity to feed themselves. We've seen UN and we've seen World Food Program leading the way, trying to help the grain out of ports like Odessa. Seems things are going well, but if anything happens, if any hiccup happens, this winter is going to be very hard for many millions of people in Africa and other parts of the world. All right, so Ukraine has enough food to feed itself, but we need to get some of that food out of Ukraine because Ukraine also feeds many other parts of the world. Now, I know World Central Kitchen has been in Ukraine from the very beginning of this conflict. You've let us follow you through that journey, and now you've expanded into Romania, Moldova, Hungary. What are you seeing there, and how does it feel to know this conflict is still happening six months later? Well, from the very beginning, we've been in in eight countries, obviously the surrounding countries, plus a little operation in Germany and uh, in Spain. And obviously this situation, uh, what we do is food in emergencies. This is an emergency. And what Wall Central Kitchen does is you cover the gap, the short term needs until the mayors, the cities, the regions, the countries can take care of the food itself. So in Poland is where we had probably our biggest impact for refugees, where we were in partnership with the mayor of Barso, feeding the biggest shelter uh, there in Barso. But uh, don't don't forget, we've been feeding in more than 1,560 refugee centers inside Ukraine for the Ukrainians displaced inside. Those are many million and also the refugees that left uh, Ukraine. So the situation uh, varies. Right now, World Central Kitchen obviously uh, has been moving from those shelters. Uh, also was in the first four months of the war, we were feeling heavily in the border uh, because we saw those long lines where people could be waiting three, four uh, days or more used to cross from pro Ukraine into the welcoming country. And World Central Kitchen and other organizations where they are making sure that those men and women will have the food uh, they needed sometimes waiting for uh, many days, as I said, under very uh, extreme cold. And at the same time, World Central Kitchen, what was doing is bringing hand mills to the many places that had no gas, no electricity, no supermarkets, no banks, because the entire infrastructure was damaged. At one moment, we were doing over 500,000 meals a day. Uh, right now, today, we move down on that number. We are doing roughly over 100,000 hot meals a day, very strategically uh, uh, given. And we are moving into food bags for the last many months, where we give one bag of food for a family of four and offer over 20 meals. And we are trying to do one thing. Everything we can, we buy inside Ukraine. This is an important moment. The international coordination is going to have to be better than ever. The governments, the humanitarian organizations, individuals, we're all going to have to be more coordinated to make sure that the aid is coming from Europe, America, and other countries, reaches the Ukrainians inside Ukraine in need, and we can help them through winter. Winter is coming, and we are all going to have to be next to Ukraine to make sure that this winter, especially in the Donbass, the east part of Ukraine, north and south, that the people will be taking care in a moment that is going to be very challenging. Chef Jose Andres, I don't know how you do it, but I'm very grateful that you do and very grateful that you're on again to share your story with us. Thank you. And President Biden is expected to make an announcement as soon as today about a plan to forgive loans for millions of Americans. Sources say Biden could forgive up to $10,000 in student loans for people who make $125,000 a year or less. White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks joins me live now for more on this. Mary Alice, what more can you tell us about this plan? I know the White House has been a little tight-lipped, but what do we know at this point and what impact is this expected to have?
Yeah, Diane, this is looking more and more likely, and we're also starting to hear rumors from sources that this announcement could include up to $20,000 in debt relief and debt cancellation for students who also received Pell Grants as a part of their financial aid package. Pell Grants typically go to sort of the most low-income students and families who are trying to earn that college degree. And I think this could have a really huge impact. Uh, remember, over a third of borrowers have less than $10,000 in student loan debt, and they tend to be uh, those who make less money year to year. Maybe they didn't finish their college degree or they took jobs uh, that don't have the same sort of wage potential. And so the White House thinks this is really helping people that need it the most and really helping people who perhaps have been having the hardest time repaying some of that debt. Well, what's the feedback? How are Democrats and Republicans responding to this? Well, wildly differently, as you can imagine. I mean, Republicans are really blasting this. They say that it looks like a handout. It looks like a cash giveaway. Uh, whereas you see some Democrats saying they don't know if this goes far enough. They were really hoping for something uh, more that would perhaps help even more students and more borrowers. I mean, this was something that a lot of Democrats campaigned on. And remember, it wasn't just progressive uh, Democrats. I mean, we had uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer really at odds with the White House over the last year, saying that something should be done on this, really push. Uh, President Biden to act on this. Democrats view this also largely as a racial equity issue. I mean, black college students often graduate with twice the number, twice the amount of debt as white uh, counterparts, as their white counterparts. And, and over time, again, because of wage discrepancies, can have a harder time repaying that debt. And more and more students have had to take on debt over the last few years as tuition prices have gone up and up and up. Now, the head of the NAACP says that this plan actually leaves black people and especially women behind. Why is that? Yeah, again, the NAACP was really hoping, I think, for, for a more sweeping announcement here. They were hoping uh, for a bigger numbers. I think that's part of the anxiety and frustration you're seeing in that statement. And the NAACP knows that black women uh, just carry such a big part of this burden. Like I said, not only do black graduates carry twice the amount of debt uh, on average, but black women especially uh, often have a hard time repaying that debt uh, because of the wage discrepancy once they graduate. Uh, we know that black women just don't make the same sort of dollar for dollar figures in, in, in so many workplaces uh, compared to white counterparts. And that makes a big difference. We also just know that so often uh, black families don't have the same level of wealth uh, going into the college process. And, and so often that leads to black families having to take on more debt to begin with. Again, that's why we've seen so many of these Democratic organizations talk about student debt cancellation as a racial equity issue. All right, Mary Alice Parks, we appreciate it as always. Thank you. And we are one step closer to November's midterm elections after the last major primary night of the season. Former Florida Governor Charlie Crist won the Democratic nomination to take on current Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. And New York Congressman Jerry Nadler beat longtime ally Carolyn Maloney after redistricting pit these two incumbents against one another. Congressional correspondent Rachel Scott joins me live now for more on this. Rachel, so great to have you here in studio, oh. in person, finally. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, Florida, because yeah. Governor Ron DeSantis now knows who he's going to be competing mm -hmm. against in November. But Charlie Crist is a former Republican governor himself, now the pick for the Democratic yeah. Party. Um, but what does that do for that race? And it was such the big question of the night. Who exactly is Ron DeSantis going to go up against in November? Now we know that it's going to be an ex-governor, yes. which is interesting. As you said, he was a former Republican governor. Now he's running as a Democrat. You know, Florida is really interesting because it's so politically divided. And right now you have more registered Republicans than Democrats. Freed, who Chris actually defeated, is the only Democrat in state wide office right now. But make no mistake about it, this is a huge test case right now for Democrats because they know Ron DeSantis is a rising star. His name has been floated around in 2024. We have no idea what decision he's going to make yet. Obviously, he wants to win this race for governor first. But how Chris campaigns in this race is going to be key for how Democrats approach 2024 and beyond. And we know he's already come out saying, if you're a DeSantis voter, I don't want your yep. vote. Kind of an interesting strategy there, a bit risky. Yeah. So we'll see how that pans out for him. Um, Congresswoman Val Demings, meanwhile, she's set to face off against Senator Marco Rubio. 
How realistic is it that Democrats can flip that seat? And Rubio is running for a third term here, but something that's interesting is that Demings is actually out fundraising him, which is kind of rare to see mm. for such an incumbent at this stage. Demings has really tried to get out in front of some of these attacks, right? So she launched her campaign on this message of law and order. Obviously, she was the first uh, black police chief, black female police chief in Orlando, trying to get ahead of some of these attacks about defund the police, change the strategy uh, that Republicans are obviously going to hand her on when it comes to Democrats and the defund the police narrative. But she does face another challenge. Again, here, you're running against an incumbent, three terms, uh, again, in a state that uh, has leaned more favorably toward Republicans in the last few years. She definitely has her work cut out for her. But if she is elected, there is a void right now in the Senate. Since Kamala Harris became vice president, there is no black female sitting U.S. Senator. Okay, let's come back to New York now. Swing district. Mm -hmm holds this special election. Yeah. Unlike the primaries, we're seeing Republican versus Democrat here. Democrat Pat Ryan ended up winning. And he had this consistent messaging that abortion was mm -hmm. on the ballot. Yep. Now, his Republican you know, rival tried to say, abortion is pretty settled in New York. Why are you saying that? And yet, he won. How much do, do you think that speaks to how much abortion is going to be an issue for the midterms? This is the news that Democrats wanted to hear this morning waking up because just weeks after Roe versus Wade was overturned, seeing how abortion has played out in some of these primaries is absolutely critical, not only in this race, but we're just weeks ago in Kansas right. there, right, where that question was put directly to voters in a conservative state and voters sided with abortion rights. So Ryan was down on the polls. There was no poll that was actually showing him leading. Abortion was such a central part of his campaign. So the fact that he came out on top, Democrats now believe that they have some of these headwinds and hoping that this becomes a driving issue for voters ahead of the midterm elections. All right, we'll see. Rachel Scott, great to have you here in it's person. Nice to be here. Thanks, nice Rachel. to see you, Diane. Thanks. And the school board in Uvalde, Texas, is expected to meet tonight to consider the firing of the school's district police chief. Pete Arredondo came under fire over the response by the police to that May 24th shooting at Robb Elementary School. The shooting, of course, took the lives of 19 children and two teachers. Senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky joins me live now for more on this new development. Aaron, a lot of this special meeting is expected to be behind closed doors. So what is the board weighing as they make this decision? And will Chief Arredondo or his attorney actually be there? We don't know whether the chief or a representative will show up to try and mount some kind of a defense. And we really don't know, Diane, what the board is considering as it decides whether to keep Arredondo on the job. And, and frankly, the community is wondering what has taken so long? Arredondo became the face of, of failure after the, the botched police response to the Uvalde mass shooting. And he really has become a focal point for the community's anger. And as long as that anger festers, uh, it really does seem to be preventing the, the, the healing and the grieving that, that the community needs and, and wants. So this is a crucial decision that will largely be discussed behind closed doors, although the results will have to be publicly announced. And is this expected to be an immediate decision or could this take a while before we find out what they've decided? could be an immediate decision. They will have to, if Arredondo is ultimately terminated, fired from his job, they will have to come out and announce it. So it could be as soon as tonight. And whether Arredondo decides to mount a defense, we don't know, but he does have defenses available to him. He has raised before, before the mass shooting at Robb Elementary School, the idea about doors locking improperly and, and the idea about doing uh, some kind of active shooter training. Not clear how vociferous he was about that, but uh, frankly, he, he also tried to mount defenses in a print interview shortly after the mass shooting where he said he wasn't really considering himself to be the leader, to be the, the on-scene commander, the way he was portrayed. But notably, Diane, when, when a House committee, a Texas House committee, did some investigating, they disputed Arredondo's characterizations of, of his own actions and, and that of his staff, and they really did pin a lot of it on him. All right, we'll be keeping an eye on that decision. Aaron Katursky, thank you. Coming up, what we're learning about the mystery illness that's reportedly killed at least 30 dogs in Michigan. What pet owners should look out for when we come back.
Welcome back. Experts are investigating an illness that has reportedly killed dozens of dogs in Michigan. The illness appears to mimic a known dog virus. Mola Lange has what people need to know to protect their pets. A warning for pet owners. A mystery illness making dogs sick, like this 10-month-old Labrador retriever, Smokey. He's among dozens of dogs in northern Michigan who have suddenly fallen ill. He started getting more sick. He started to take a, a, a sharp turn uh, down and started getting the, the vomiting was become more and more. He stopped eating and then uh, wouldn't drink anything. So far, there have been at least 30 reported deaths. Veterinarians scrambling to figure out why. Within like two days, their dogs had died. And then we started hearing more and more um, about dogs that had passed away with the same symptoms. State officials now investigating if it may be a new strain of canine parvovirus, which is highly contagious and spread from dog to dog by direct contact. What is um, different or unique is that these cases were brought to our attention. And in these specific instances, they may have tested negative within their veterinary clinic, but they are still showing signs suggestive of parvovirus. And so it could be a different strain. Symptoms include lethargy, vomiting, diarrhea, while it can affect all dogs, unvaccinated dogs and puppies younger than four months are most at risk. Owner David Eagle considers himself among the lucky ones. Smokey recovering after getting sick last month. He's doing great. Um, knock on wood, we've been, we've been pretty lucky. He bounced back in, uh, I would say, about a week. You could tell he was starting to feel a little bit better and the tail was wagging more. And well, the good news is there is a way to keep your dogs safe and healthy. Get them vaccinated. And if they're showing any signs of symptoms, alert their veterinarian. Diane? Mola Lange, thank you for that. Coming up, the major dinosaur discovery in Texas. Well, receding waters there have revealed after more than 110 million years. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're learning more about an incredible discovery in Texas more than 100 million years in the making. Severe drought conditions at Dinosaur Valley State Park have revealed actual dinosaur tracks. Our Marcus Moore is there. The Dinosaur Valley State Park in Glen Rose, Texas, announcing these giant imprints belong to two species of dinosaurs, which scientists say roamed the land 113 million years ago. Look at this size. One of the species, called the Sorrel Poseidon, stood 60 feet tall and weighed nearly 100,000 pounds. You see the claw marks. The tracks are normally found underwater and usually filled with sediment. But the incredible geological discovery comes at a painful price. They were discovered due to a devastating drought, which is plaguing more than 90% of the state before the violent storms of the last few days. These dramatic weather swings, a symptom of the climate crisis, which has increased the potential for more frequent periods of drought and intense rainfall. This is just the latest secret revealed as bodies of water dry up thanks to drought conditions across the U.S. and the world. Several sets of human remains were discovered at Lake Mead when the reservoir dropped to about 27% of its full capacity. They've been finding bodies, I feel like, every week or so. It's been, it's been kind of crazy. Lake Mead is a vital source of water for millions of people across several states in Mexico. Last week, the federal government issued a water shortage, which requires Arizona, Nevada, and Mexico to reduce their use of water after the levels in the Colorado River reached record lows. And Diane, another look here at Dinosaur Valley State Park here in Texas. And, and look at this. These are the dinosaur prints that scientists say are more than 100 million years old. And ordinarily, they are covered by water and filled with sediment. But you can see them clearly now. And they go on for more than 300 yards down this riverbed here. And uh, for the very first time, they were able to map these, these footprints and measure them, uh, all because of the extreme drought conditions here. Diane. Marcus Moore, thanks for that. I'm Diane Macedo. Thank you for joining us and stay with us as ABC News Live continues. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.